I'm going to begin this new series with a great and famous work by one of the leading masters of the late Yuan dynasty, that is Huang Meng, and the painting is his Dwelling in the Qingbian Mountains, which he painted in 1366. This is generally recognized as his masterpiece and is one of the monuments of later Chinese painting. It's in the Shanghai Museum now, and it's been written about many times. Um, the major writing on it in English, apart from my own treatment of it in a number of books, uh, is by Richard Vinograd, who teaches now at Stanford University. His uh, dissertation and a long article on it, these will be listed in the readings, which I'll uh, append to my notes for this lecture. Uh, the Qingbian Mountains painting, with all the issues that it raises, offers, I think, an exemplary and powerful case of how the creation and the expression of a painting can be uh, related to the circumstances of the artist's life and the things going on around him, political, historical uh, circumstances of his time. Um, I'll also use this as a beginning comment on the whole nature and direction of later Chinese painting, as I've recently come to construct it. And I'll cite a recent article of my own titled um, Some Thoughts on the History and Post-History of Chinese Painting, in which I use this painting, along with several others, um, to exemplify how some of the uh, finest work of later Chinese painting draws heavily on uh, the art of their past in a way that goes beyond what we saw in Southern Sung painting generally, especially Academy painting. Academy painters didn't in this way so much draw on the past typically. They were more likely to depict what they saw around them. All right, with that beginning, uh, we'll go on. Here to begin with is the whole painting. It's 141 by 42 centimeters in size, and it's painted in ink on paper. The artist's inscription, written in the upper right, reads, In the fourth lunar month of the 26th year of the Zhejiang era, which corresponds to May-June of 1366 in our calendar, I, the Yellow Crane Mountain Man, Wang Shu Ming, painted this dwelling in seclusion in the Qingbian Mountains picture. N. Uh, many collector seals are on the painting, including the over-familiar imperial seals and inscription of the Qianlong Emperor, and the script by the late Ming artist scholar Dong Chi Chang is mounted above the painting. Since Wang Lang lived from 1308 to 1385, the work belongs to his middle period, the period of his finest works. I myself first encountered this painting in Max Lerer's lectures. Lerer had written an article on Wang Lang while still in Germany, an article I later painstakingly translated from the German. And I was able to see it once more closely in a photograph of it that I found among the pa papers of, the, of Archibald Wenley, the Fruer Gallery's director, after his death. I wrote about it several times in writings of my own, and my student Richard Vinograd, next please, here is Richard Vinograd, made it the topic of his 1979 doctoral dissertation, and later in 1982 published an important article about it, titled Family Properties, Personal Content and Cultural Pattern in Wang Meng's Bian Mountains of 1366. In his article, he renders Qingbian quite correctly as Blue Bian, Mount Bian, that is, which can be perceived as blue in color. I'm continuing to use the more conventional title, Qingbian. Next. An article by Joseph Zhang, which I'll also cite and include in the readings, isn't about the Qingbian painting in particular, but about a different Wang Meng painting that I'll show in a bit. It helps to illuminate, however, the background of the Qingbian painting and the historical circumstances in which the artist painted it. Next. I've already shown several times in different connections this painting. It's the second half of a hand scroll landscape titled Autumn Colors on the Chao Wenhua Mountains, painted in 1396 by Zhao Mengfu. He was an extremely important painter, calligrapher, and statesman of the early Yuan period one of those who took official office under the new Mongol regime, when many other Chinese, out of loyalty to the fallen Sung dynasty, went into retirement and didn't seek public office. 
Zhao Mengfu served with distinction under the first Yuan Emperor Kublai Khan and his successors. His son Zhao Yun and his grandson Zhao Lin were also painters and also had official careers. Wang Meng was himself a grandson of Zhao Mengfu through his mother's side, and so he was related to the Zhao family. His Qingbian Mountains painting was done for his uncle Zhao Lin. Next, please. <clears throat> Let me note briefly here before going on that a book on Zhao Meng Fu has recently been published by Shane McCausland. I haven't yet acquired it or read it, so I only bring it to your attention. Next, please. Wang Meng's Qingbian Mountains painting depicts the family retreat at this mountain, which is located some six miles northwest of the city of Hujo, modern Wuxing in Jiangsu province, which was the home of the Zhao family. In this old map, which is taken from Joseph Zhang's article, the walled city is seen just above center with a prominent pagoda. The uh, Bien Mountain, labeled as that, appears just to the upper left of this. In 1366, when Wang Meng did his painting, this region was being devastated by warfare, ongoing battles between two contenders for the succession to the much weakened Yuan or Mongol regime. One of these was Zhu Yuan Zhang, who would be the victor and would found the succeeding Ming dynasty. The other was Zhang Shicheng, who controlled much of the southeast region with his power centered in the city of Suzhou. A decisive victory was won by Zhu Yuan Zhang in December of 1366 in a battle fought near Wuxing. So the region that Wang Meng's painting represents was very much in a state of turmoil, its inhabitants in jeopardy, no longer the safe haven it had represented for the family. Wang Meng himself had served as an official, then retired to his own retreat at Yellow Crane Mountain near Hangzhou. He signs the painting as the Yellow Crane Mountain Man, Huang Hao Shan, Shan Ren. He sometimes signed uh, his paintings as Huang Hao Shan Chao, woodcutter of the Yellow Crane Mountain. Wang could not remain in retirement, however, he had to continue to be involved in family and political affairs that were for him inescapable. After the founding of the Ming in 1368, he took office again, serving in Shandong province, but he fell victim to a bloody purge carried out by the first Ming emperor, Zhu Yuanzhong, and died in prison in 1385. Next, please. Now I want to set up a kind of background for the Qingbian Mountains painting by putting in beside it a series of earlier landscapes, all of them shown and discussed in previous lectures, landscapes of the kind that Wang Meng probably knew since he moved in the elevated circles of collectors, including those in his own family. I'm not claiming, that is, that he knew any of these particular paintings, but only that they represent the kinds of paintings that make up his stylistic background. And this background isn't of the old traditional kind, in which the artist learns from his immediate predecessor and alters this inherited style in the pattern that Gombrich writes about as inherited schemata and correction, but the new kind, representing possibilities of stylistic choice that were open to artists of the educated upper class who had access to collections and were often themselves collectors. This new conscious kind of drawing on the past is a big part of what this whole new series is about, and it's the reason for its title, Gazing into the Past. So now we see Wang Meng gazing into the past and using it for his personal purposes. This anonymous painting found in a Liao tomb and datable to sometime shortly after the middle of the 10th century can represent the kind of landscape with spatial complexities that moves from a foreground with figures to a middle ground representing a refuge or a retreat and then on to the mountain peaks above and beyond. The derivations by Yuan period artists from landscapes of this kind was discussed in my own old article on the Liao painting, and Vinograd published an article on the subject. Note especially as a clue to this, the appearance of the dog's head projection from the main peak, seen in the upper right of both paintings. Next. The landscape type created by Dung Yuan around the same time also underlies Wang Meng's painting, we have no actual example by Dung Yuan, but this copy from an album of reduced-sized copies of old paintings with facing inscriptions by Gu Dongqi Chang, the Xiaozhong Xian Da album, will have to serve. Um, 
The build-up of mountain forms in Wong's, Wong's painting, and the spaces they define, the distinctive shapes of mountain tops, and other features can be seen to derive from the Dungaran landscape type. Next, please. This painting, ascribed loosely to Dungaran's disciple Juran, and shown only briefly in my discussion of him, is probably older than Wang Meng in date, and offers another model for his elaborate system of working back from an entrance in the foreground to a retreat with buildings in the far middle ground, and an elaborate build-up of distinctively shaped peaks above. Next. From Guaxi's early spring of 1072, or some painting like it, Wang Meng could have learned how to use a strong light-dark shading to give volume to his landscape masses and a restless kind of animation to the whole. Next. Or from some painting like this one by a follower of Fan Quan, how to dramatize the landscape forms with strong shading and a powerful quasi-animation of what should be inert earth masses. Drawing on all these, or paintings like them, Wang Meng possessed a rich inheritance of expressive means that permitted him to manipulate landscape forms for his own particular purposes. And this manipulation of old forms and composition, or compositional devices, can in turn, as I noted earlier, be convincingly related to his own situation in the late Yuan and the situation of his family members and others, including the recipient of this painting, Zhao Lin. Next. My point in showing these comparisons, however, is not merely to indicate the kind of older paintings that Wang Meng knew and drew on, although that was part of my purpose, too. More importantly, perhaps, I want to establish the background of familiarity with old paintings that Wang could assume in his literati class viewers, which set up in them expectations about the meaning, the message of such paintings, expectations that Wang Meng could then violate or subvert by transforming the elements of style that carried those meanings, here secure refuge within the landscape, and delivering powerfully an opposed or contrary message, a landscape that no longer can offer that kind of security. That is the meaning underlying the Qingbian Mountains painting, as I read it. And I'll show how he does this when we come to look at the painting in detail. I should add that this kind of reading of later Chinese landscapes is one that I've used over the years in various contexts. For, for instance, in treating the landscapes of the late Ming master Wu Bin, who draws on the old northern Sung monumental landscape tradition, which is familiar in Nanjing, where he was partly based, in order to subvert the expectations of stability and order that those old paintings aroused. One place I do this is in the third chapter of my compelling image book. This is a frequent and very effective stratagem used by some later Chinese painters and can be recognized only by visual studies of the kinds that under underlie this whole series and most of my writing, texture of no use in this regard. <clears throat> okay, now I want to show another series of comparisons, this time to exemplify the landscape of reclusion as a compositional type, what Vinograd calls landscapes of property because they represented places with which particular people identified and in which they felt comfortable and secure. Next. In Lecture 8b of the first series, the one on literati painting of the late Northern Sung period, I showed this landscape, painted in ink on silk and badly worm-eaten, as a probable copy of a well-known or at least well-recorded work by Wen Tong, who is best known as a painter of bamboo. It's in the old collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and it's been pretty much forgotten. I myself recognize it as the earliest example known to me of a landscape type, the landscape of reclusion, in which the composition is divided into two parts, an enclosed part in which typically the recluse's house is seen, surrounded by high hills or otherwise protected and shut off from the outside world, and an opening out part that stands for his ability to move out into the big world when he chooses to do that usually by boat from a river or lakeshore. Here, these two parts are respectively at left and at right. I wrote about landscapes of this type in my chapter on meanings and functions in Chinese landscape painting in my 1988 book, Mean uh, Three Alternative Histories of Chinese Painting. This chapter uh, was based on a lecture I gave in a series, which in turn was based on a seminar 
on this topic that I held with my grad students in Berkeley. The subject had been brought to my attention when one of my good students, Ginger Xu, was asked by one of our Western art faculty in an oral exam, why did Chinese artists paint so many landscapes? Why did Chinese want pictures of landscape hanging on their walls? And she was hard put for an answer, because I hadn't addressed this large question adequately in my teaching. I didn't use this painting after one tongue in that chapter because I hadn't recognized its importance in this regard yet. I did reproduce, as a typical example, a painting by Wang Meng that we'll consider in a moment. I should say that my three alternative histories book didn't make much of a splash when it came out, but it's had an important impact on the field since then because it introduces, effectively, I think, big issues and approaches to Chinese painting based on my use of visual analysis the only way there is to deal with these issues. Joseph Zhang, who's a good scholar of the text-reading sort, reproduces the Wang Meng painting that I use there, but he uses it for a very different purpose. Next, please. This painting, a short hand scroll by Wang Meng, titled by him the Yunlin Xiaoyin, or Small Retreat Among Clouds and Forests, was the one I used to represent the compositional type, and is the main subject of Joseph Zhang's article. I took it from a reproduction, not knowing the location of the original. Later it turned up on a private collection, and Joseph was able to see it and study it in the original before writing his article. The composition is divided diagonally, as you see, with the dense and secluded part in the upper left, and the opening out part in the lower right. Wang Meng painted it for another of his relatives that his first cousin once removed, Sui Sheng, whose other name was Yan Hui. On a separate piece of paper mounted after the painting, Wang Meng wrote a long poem dedicated to his cousin and to his retreat. Cao Yanhui, or excuse me, Cui Yanhui, um, back, back. Cui Yanhui moved to his place, which was also located on Bian Mountain, sometime in the 1370s, about a decade after Wang Meng painted his Qinglian Mountains for his cousin Zhao Lin. Here, as in the Wan Tong composition, it is security and enclosure that are emphasized. Vinograd, who also reproduces and discusses this painting in his article, ends his discussion with this paragraph, and I quote, One of the ways in which a landscape could become endowed with human personality is here revealed. Cui Yanhui's retreat in the Bian Mountains represented a conscious affirmation of his own character. Cui's discovery of the site and his building of a dwelling there is imbued with the quality of self-discovery that culminated in his epiphany under the drifting clouds when he gave himself in his studio a new name and identity. End quote. Ha <laughs> it's a pleasure and an honor to have had a student who can write like that. Well, okay, next please. Another notable example of the landscape of reclusion by Wang Meng is this, his undated Hua Qi Yu Yin Tu, or Fisherman Recluse on the Flowery Stream, painted in ink and colors on paper, about 129 by 58 centimeters in size. It's in the Palace Museum, Taipei. Actually, this is one of three old versions of the painting in that collection, two of them so close that, according to my old notes, C.C. Wong, major connoisseur that he was, identified one of them as the genuine work one year and another one the next year. Uh, this is the one I reproduced and discussed in my Hills Beyond a River book. The composition is again divided diagonally along a series of peaks on the river shore. The lower part represents the man's seclusion, the upper part his option of moving out into the great world, even into far distance, as represented by the distant hills and upper right. He himself is seen at the bottom of the picture, fishing from his boat under a flowering tree, with a female companion, and what must be picnic supplies seen under the boat shelter. Next, please. Above and further back, we see his house on the shore, surrounded by willows and leafy trees, still within the enclosed part of the composition. His wife waits patiently for his return. <laughs> As a recent New York Times article about the absence of the ideal of monogamy in China, in China pointed out, having more than one wife, or a wife and more than one concubines, was expected of a man who was well, well, well enough off to afford it. It was more to his credit than a matter of resentment and shame. 
And the same attitudes and practices persist in today's China, where rich men keep mistresses more or less openly. Next. Finally, for this painting, here is a detail from the upper part where the diagonal row of, row of pointed hills ends with another of Wang's dog, dog's head earth masses, and a cluster of houses is seen. It was normal and desirable for the recluse's hideaways to be located near villages where help and supplies could be obtained as needed. Next, please. As a final example of this landscape of reclusion, here is another painted by Wang Meng, an undated hand scroll titled Retreat at the Foot of Mount Hui. Painted in ink on paper and about 74 centimeters long, it's in the Indianapolis Museum of Art, and it's reproduced with a detail and discussed in my Hills Beyond a River book. Although compositionally similar to the others, it's a lesser work, done in a kind of sketchy manner, perhaps while Wang Meng was inebriated. He himself writes in his inscription about awakening, literally sobering up, after a spring dream, he writes. And I wrote about it, quote, This is the kind of painting that an artist might do almost casually for a friend, possibly to repay a minor obligation. One can imagine Wong staying overnight with the dedicatee, his respected family friend, Xu Jing, painting the picture as the two sat, drinking and talking, and inscribing it the next morning before he continued on his trip. End quote. Xu Jing is seen reading a book at the window of a room opening out of the water. The composition is of the type now familiar, but it's rendered in a looser, sketchier manner. Next, please. Let me just add here an obvious but important point. Wang Meng is master of constructing landscape compositions that convey in the readings they invite the structure of meaning they are intended to embody. These have been examples of one type, his images of reclusion. My chapter on meanings and functions in Chinese landscape paintings discusses others, using examples to show how the compositional structure conveys the message. One of these others is the painting now on the screen by an early Ming artist, Wang Fu, an example of another type, the farewell painting, in which a group of figures is seen in a pavilion on the shore at the bottom, Friends come to bid farewell to the man who's departing to become an official, with a boatman waiting in his boat nearby. And then the riverbank stretches back into the far distance, representing the man's passage to his new post. Reading paintings in this way is a simple idea, but one that's ignored by too many of our specialists writing about Chinese landscape painting. To ignore this, to say, don't look at the picture, look at the brushwork, is a profound missing the point. Now back to our main subject. Okay. <clears throat> Before we return at last to the Qingbian painting, for a detailed viewing of it, however, I want to introduce a little-known painting that Wang Meng did in the year before, 1365. It's titled Xia Shan Gao Yin Tu, or Lofty Recluse in Summer Mountains. Painted in ink and colors on silk, it's in the Palace Museum, Beijing. We were shown it on our 1977 painting delegation trip, and permitted to photograph it, although it hadn't yet been published, so far as I know. It doubtless has been by now, but I can't refer you to a reproduction. I remember thinking what a great present it would be to bring back for Rick Vinograd just then writing his dissertation on the Qingbian Mountains painting of the following year, to bring back the slides of a major and related work compositionally elaborate and exciting done in the preceding year. He didn't use it, however, in his article. In this image of the whole, we can already see Wang Meng creating a richly detailed, elaborate, and dynamic composition within which the image of a scholar living in seclusion is small and hard to find, almost as though he were experimenting or practicing with means that he would use with immensely greater effect in the following year. The next. The peaks at the top have the familiar Dungyuan Juran shape. The sky is darkened to make this an evening scene. Next. Something like the dog's head projection is seen here, and a waterfall much like the one in Qingbian Mountains. These are items in Wang Meng's repertory of landscape forms used in his paintings of this kind. Next. Further down, we begin to see groves of trees silhouetted against the misty bases of the large mountain forms, and in the lower right, the roofs of what appear to be temple buildings. 
Next. A closer detail that reveals the dynamism of the forms and the strange lighting that dramatized Wang's landscape, removing it from naturalism. Next. A valley divides the central part of the composition with temple buildings at the top and a stream flowing down over rocks and trees on the shore. Next. This detail reveals that Wang, Wang has also situated a house further down on the shore, surrounded by tall pine trees. Next. And finally, a detail from the lower right corner reveals the real narrative center of the painting, the lofty recluse of the title, seen sitting in a familiar pose in the open porch of his house with the boy's servant, or is it his wife, standing beside him, holding something like a bowl. Wang Meng presumably did the painting for some friend or patron whose retirement home somehow fit the impressive surroundings that the artist makes the main subject of his picture. Next, back to the Qingbian Mountains. Now, with all this as preparation, we return to the Qingbian Mountains painting to look at it for more closely and in details. Its history up to modern times is outlined in Vinograd study, and I'll only sketch it in briefly. It was owned by the number of major collectors in the Ming and Qing times, including Xiang Yuanbian, who probably owned it when Dong Xichang saw and inscribed it. After a time it was in the after a time in the Imperial Collection, it emerged into private hands in the early nineteenth century, and about a century later, in the early twentieth, it was owned by the major Shanghai collector Di Bao Shen or Di Pingzi, whose heirs sold it after his death. Si Si Wang always lamented not having raised the money to buy it. It probably could have been purchased by the Freer or any other Western buyer if anyone there had understood its unique importance. The photo I found among Winley's papers probably means that it was offered at some point to the Freer, but probably at a price higher than any that the Freer was willing to pay for a post sung painting. This was still before the greatness of Yuan painting was recognized. Fortunately, it passed into the Shanghai Museum in the 1950s and has been kept there ever since. Next. <clears throat> we enter the picture at the bottom, over water, fed by a stream that pours down into it. This and the agitated treatment of the tree foliage already impart a dynamic energy to the very fabric of the picture, the combination of somewhat loose brushwork and dynamic forms that make viewing it a visually exciting experience. Next. Throughout the painting, there are strange parallels and echoings of lines and forms, as here, where the bending of a tree is paralleled by the movement along the crest of an earth bank at its left. Tree foliage and clusters of dian or dots sometimes, sometimes seem unattached, vibrating in the air or on the painting surface. Next, please. The trees are varied in type and freely disposed across the bottom part. As we move rightward, however, they diminish in size as the scene recedes a bit, and a figure appears walking along the path of the road that enters from the right. There's no indication of where this road goes. It does not reappear at the left, but disappears among the trees. Next. A close-up detail showing the figure, a man heavily robed and wearing a fitted cap pointed at the top and holding a staff in his left hand. Like so much else in the picture, he is mysterious. No indication is provided of who he is or where he is going. He may have meant more to the original recipient, Zhao Lin, or others of the time, but we'd, we'd, for he doesn't mean much to us. Note here again the heavy application of dry black ink, not applied in brush strokes, but laid on with a semi-dry brush, pushed against the paper, on the tree and the contours of earthworms. Next, please. Moving upward, we see the upper parts of the leafy trees in the lower left corner, and above them, the sudden move into depth. We are pulled back by a lightning of ink tone and by parallel, diagonally disposed rises of earth. These seem like a distant echo of the very old technique of rendering a receding earth surface with parallel folds and shading from one to the other. In the upper left corner of this detail, we look over the edge of the last of these receding parallels into the beginnings of what we'll see to be a receding valley. The area of empty space, empty paper, 
must be read as a small lake or a pond fed by another stream flowing into it from the upper right. Next. Moving rightward to a detail that has always been a special favorite of mine for the visual excitement that it evokes, a ridge rising from lower right and topped by eight trees of varied types, leafy and bare. It suddenly curls over and drops our gaze into a strangely lit hollow, perhaps a gorge filled with mist. As in Guashi's early spring of three centuries earlier, the earth masses are powerfully shaped with light and dark, but then they are charged with unnatural movement that suggests a world in flux, changing before our eyes. Next. Moving leftward and up a bit, we see the same row of trees, now in lower right, silhouetted against the steep slope behind them, and echoed to the left across the stream by another row of trees, mostly pines but with strangely twisted bare trees in lower left, another at the right end. Through these trees we can see another stream flowing down from another pond in the upper left. We are moving back along the secluded valley that occupies the center left side of the composition, corresponding loosely with the Wang Valley that was central in the 1365 painting that we saw earlier. Wang Meng is using compositional devices, that is, that he has learned or developed in creating many landscape paintings before this. He is at the height of his powers. Next, please. A detail that shows some of the same area, but also a further passage above it. We can see again how Wang Meng sets up strange echoes or repetitions of earth forms, and also lights them unnaturally in this detail. We see also how insistently many of his earth masses point upward, pushing the eye in that direction. Chinese landscape paintings had always been designed to be read that way, bottom that is closest, to the top, which is furthest. But the upward push is given greater power here by these insistent repetitions of shapes. Next. And with this detail, above and to the left, we come at last to the narrative focus of the entire composition, uh, the Zhao family retreat that should have been a safe refuge against hostile forces in the outer world, and now is not. It's located at the head of the valley and is composed of several houses. A massive dark landscape form, strongly shaped, seems to overhang it at right, already violating the air of security that the surroundings of secluded retreats normally gave to them. And the whole landscape, below and above, works powerfully to intensify that effect of disruption of the expected security and stability. Next, please. Moving in closer, we see, see a man, simply drawn, in discontinuous ink line, and presumably meant to represent Zhao Lin, seated at a table, not looking out, as such figures more commonly do, but entirely self-absorbed. There is no wife, no servants, no supporting figures, only this tiny, isolated image of a man reduced to impotence by the overwhelming turbulence of his surroundings. Here we see a deeply affecting example of Wang Meng's ability to subvert the normal implications of his imagery and turn it to quite different, even opposed, expressive purposes. Next. Above and to the right of the images of buildings and the single figure, facing onto the dark overhanging bluff that seemed to threaten them, is this strongly lit cliff rising sheer. Wang Meng can draw on all the devices for achieving effects of space, light, and tactile surfaces in landscape painting that had been developed over the centuries, the quasi-progress that we traced in lectures in our first series. These were part of the legacy of any artist who had, act, who had access to old paintings and could learn from them. And if he was the right kind of great creative master, could use them for entirely new, anti-natural, and highly unsettling purpose. Next. Here is the whole upper part of this extraordinary painting. In defining in that way Wang Meng's highly conscious uses of the past, are we seeing here a phenomenon curiously parallel to the ways Western artists from Cezanne to Picasso and beyond drew on the painting of their own past for radically new effects? Many art historians want to quickly shoot down anyone who makes such a suggestion, ruling it inadmissible. They are of the kind who kept my friend Jim Elkin's book which was guilty of speculation of that kind. Next, please. Here a photo of Jim Elkins. K. 
kept his book from being published until he had thoroughly rewritten it into arguments they found more tolerable. But the importance of recognizing that kind of parallel lies behind my use of the term post-historical for later Chinese painting, a term applied by its inventor, Hans Belting, next please, here is Hans Belting in his book, applied by Hans Belting to just that late period of European painting. I adopted the term and the idea from Hans Belting, whom I was later to meet and talk with about it, as the right way to understand much of the painting of the period from Yuan onward. I thought this would be a useful contribution to the ongoing arguments about how post-Sung painting should be understood. But my younger colleagues have conspicuously ignored that suggestion of mine, instead making their arguments about how the Yuan period doesn't really represent a sharp break in Chinese painting history at all. Future generations will decide whether mine was, in fact, a suggestion that opens up new ways of thinking, as I myself, of course, believe it to be. Next. Back to the upper part of Wang Meng's painting, where a waterfall drops down into the strangely lighted space of the previous image. When we move in to look more closely at that, we're drawn into another region of dynamically interacting masses and ambiguous spatial relationships. The fist-like projection in lower left isn't even clearly bounded along its right edge, and our reading of the light and dark areas in upper left is unclear. Which is in front? Which is behind? Next, please. This detail, from along the right contour of the main mountain mass, is the other of my special favorites for this painting. It reveals the sheer energy of the artist's hand. Think back to the passage near the end of our first lecture, in which I tried to show how brush strokes are read as traces of movement through what I called empathic kinesthesis. And imagine the feeling of painting this. Our familiar dog's head projection is seen, but here it's part of a flow of sheer energy that largely dematerializes it. When an artist can charge his hand with this kind of unbounded dynamism, meanwhile keeping complete control of his artistic means, we are in the presence of greatness. Next, please. Our final detail for this painting, showing the mountain summit, uh, its shape with the slanting top and the split-off part at right, along with the lumpy alum rock formation that projecting from its front surface, these are elements of the Dungyuan Juron tradition and provide a more traditional ending for the composition, one that somehow holds it all in. But even here, look at the strangely shaped opening of sky at the left, and how the earth surfaces that surround it all seem to pour into it, like water over a waterfall. Nowhere in the painting does the artist's hand really relax, relax its constant energy and sheer creativity. Well, that concludes our detailed visual tour over the surface of this extraordinary masterwork, and I hope you've been persuaded of its greatness, besides picking up some useful clues about how to look at a Chinese painting. Next, please. Finally, for this lecture, I show three paintings that I used in the opening pages of my lecture and article I spoke of earlier called Some Thoughts on the History and Post-History of Chinese Painting, I used in making my point about how much of the most interesting of later Chinese painting reworks in this way images from its past. Wang Meng's Qingbian Mountains of 1366, Dong Qichang's Mount Qingbian painting done in 1617, and a landscape by Zhu Da or Bada Shanran, undated but painted around the very end of the 17th century. He died around 1705. Dong Qichang's painting in the center although it bears more or less the same title as Wang Meng's, was not based on Wang's painting, but on a painting of the same subject by Zhao Meng Fu, now lost. So Wang Meng, who must have known Zhao Meng Fu's painting, probably used that too as one of his models. Next, please. Dong Chi Chang's painting, although it begins at the bottom with the conventional row of trees on the shore, scarcely attempts any real effects of space and distance, being largely a complex construction rising sheer as a flat surface, but made up of forms organized into a structure of loosely repeated units. For the origin of this way of constructing a landscape, we would have to go back to Wang Meng's important predecessor, Huang Gung Wang, but that's for a different lecture, which I will also give in this series. Next. 
Deng Xichang also succeeds in giving mass and movement to his powerful forms and adds almost perfunctorily details of paths and steps. It's a kind of painting that depends for its effects even more than Wang Meng's on cultivated responses in viewers familiar with earlier painting. Next. Bada Shanran's landscape depends heavily on the radical innovations made by Dong Chang. That this arch-individualist should have learned so much from the founder of the Orthodox school may seem an anomaly, but it's clearly true. Whether he knew this particular work by Dong is a question. I'm not arguing for derivations painting from painting, only in general style. Next. But our Shanran's landscape begins at the bottom with the same relatively stable row of trees on the shore as Dong Chang's, but already his more extreme oddity appears, for instance in his insistent repetitions of the small rocks in the water, made into all but abstract forms. Next. The painting is full of allusions to older styles, with Huang Gung Mong and Dong Chang prominent among them. But they read more as stylistic allusions, recognizable by, the, by those familiar with the older master's works, more than as elements of real representation, a picture. And the drawing throughout is charged with that intense energy that one writer about Bada Shanran, Gustav Eka, referred to as brush delirium. My lecture on Bada Shanran, which will follow this at some point, will treat the question of his alleged madness. He was indeed seriously deranged, at least in some stage of his life. Next, please. The summit of Bada Shanran's mountain would be difficult to read for anyone whose eyes were not conditioned by familiarity with earlier works of the kind he's alluding to. The way its right side seems to, seems to be eaten away can only be understood, and I mean a kind of visual understanding, if I can use such a term, not intellectual, only understood by reference to the mountain tops in earlier paintings, next, such as Dong Chang's Qingbian Mountains. Looking back at it, we realize that Bada Shanran is giving us his version of the convention of bands of fog floating across the peak and hiding parts of it. This convention is already pushed close to unreadability in some of Dong Chang's paintings. In Bada Shanran's, it's over the edge. Next, please. So, there is my opening lesson on how to look at later Chinese painting, or at least some of it, and some of the most interesting of it. If you want to see likenesses between their highly sophisticated transformations of forms into near abstraction, parallels with what Cezanne does with a dish of apples, or Picasso with a guitar or a female nude, fine, that's up to you. I will continue to make my own arguments about these paintings as we see more of them, and learned more about their artists in the remaining lectures in this series, Gazing into the Past. I trust that this first one has been a stimulating, even an exciting experience of directed or assisted gazing.